Welcome to the Fly Dog Fly Talk podcast. It's our third episode. We got a big show today, guys. You ready to go? Got that right. Let's do it. Yeah. Choo choo. So um, it is <laughs> nine o'clock Saturday morning. We got home at two a.m. from watching Interstellar. Yep. We will talk about that later. Not right now because we don't want to spoil anything for anybody. Um, we're going to talk about um, our favorite shots from films we like. We're going to talk a little bit about Star Wars and the Hunger Games. And then the last half of the show, uh, we'll dive into the Christopher Nolan-ness of Interstellar. So you guys ready to go? Let's do it. All right, go yes, ahead. Yes, again. Uh, I'm Austin. I, yeah, identify yourselves. <laughs> I'm Austin. Because Blake, Blake's I'm back not, this week. I'm, I'm here. Not, I'm, I'm not ready. Austin. Hi, I'm Tyler. <laughs> I think I always start off every episode with a high-pitched high. Hey. Every time. Hey, guys. What's it's going to be my thing. It, it was a weird thing last week. It was funny, but... That's me. I'm a weird thing. <laughs> but funny. Yeah. But funny. <laughs> but funny. <laughs> That's weird. So I kind of wanted to start today off talking about um, our favorite shots in movies, uh, why that is, and then maybe what we can learn. Um, from them to apply to our own productions. So does anybody have a favorite shot from a movie? I do. um, But Hunter, why don't you go first? Why? Because I want to think about mine a little bit longer. (laughs) (laughs) So you don't. I have one one that I don't know if it's my favorite shot, but it's like as soon as you asked the question, that's what popped in my head. Uh, The very first shot of The Dark Knight, you get this big like over the city, Mm -hmm. like... When I saw The Dark Knight the first time, I was in it was an IMAX theater, so like, and I was right in the middle, and it just so you I don't used know. to be rich. No, no, it was my birthday. Oh, so. Okay, treat myself, and then, so like the very first shot, like it's kind of disorienting, like being in this IMAX theater, like right in the middle, so you get this huge match of screen, and then like flying over Gotham City. It was just really cool. Shot really well. That's yeah, so. What do you think that that can teach you about? Movie making in general. Um, we need a helicopter wowing. budget. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of my favorite things about that shot is it established the bigness of that world. Oh, yeah. Right away. Bigness. I mean, that large format, the large widescreen aspect. I mean, you knew it wasn't going to be a small, tiny little story. Yeah. So have you ever heard of CSI? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they have a couple shots like that. <laughs> helicopter shots? Yeah. But there was Not no... shot on IMAX. But there was, and there was no Batman. That's true. You can't compare Batman. That whole sequence from the beginning of that movie is probably my favorite, like, sequence, that whole bank robbery. Yeah. I mean, it is a different kind of superhero movie way to begin it. I just... I I think he's everything going wrong. Yeah. I think he tries to copy that in Dark Knight Rises, but I don't know if it's... It's not really the same, but it's still... It it drops you in right in the middle of of something. But I don't think it compares to the Dark Knight. Mm. I don't know. It's just more fun, I guess. More fun. More funner. Funnerest. The funnerest. Um, I think along the same lines as Joey, as far as bigness, um, I would say that one of my favorite shots is from the opening scenes of The Lonesome Dove. Ooh. Um, For some reason, just comparing... It's a Western, Blake. All right, thank you. Okay. It's with uh, Robert Duvall and Kevin Costner. Great. I think you mean open range. I just want to make sure I was thinking of the same (laughs) movie. Uh, But some of those opening shots are very establishing of the scale of the wilderness compared to the landscape compared to Robert Duvall and Kevin Costner and their little cattle gang, their little uh, cattle ranchers. And I don't know, some of those, they just... There's such small characters and such a bigger thing, I think. Um, but yet, at the end of the story, they still kind of they make uh, their actions mean something. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that's a good idea to go for for shots is to use your shots to back up your story. If that makes sense. Yeah. Am I just talking? To talk? <laughs> I think that makes sense. I mean, of course it makes sense to use your camera shots to back up your story. <laughs> camera shots and make great cut. movies. <laughs> <laughs> now, I get what you're saying, though. Um, I don't know what our fascination is with 
with opening shots. Uh, both of you guys had opening shots. What came to my mind was also an opening shot. Um, I myself, I'm uh, what they call them, Whedon heads. I'm a big fan of all of Joss Whedon's work. Um, I think those are called pot heads. Oh, okay, that's what it was. <laughs> I get those mixed up all the time. Um, yeah, so you know, he has his favorite, or he has his. Uh, Big show, Firefly, that a lot of people like. Um, I'm a big fan of the show. I guess. It, you know, it got canceled after it's just d- in the middle of its first season, but mm. later they were able to make a movie, Serenity, and uh, kind of continue on the show and in the story. And um, at the very beginning, I don't think it's the first shot, but it's one of the first. Uh, it's, it shows the name of the ship that they're on, which is Serenity. And it backs out and kind of swoops around, and then it goes into the cabin of the of the spaceship. And it does this one take where it kind of leads you throughout the ship, following the captain and introducing into each of the other members of the crew. And it does a really good job of establishing these characters for the first time. If you hadn't watched the show, but even if you had, just kind of relating to them, and then showing you the layout of the ship, which they never really got to do on the show. Um, and it's just a really cool shot how. They very quickly teach you who they are and why they're there. I've always really liked that shot. I think jumping in on good, I mean, you guys have all talked about establishing shots and uh, presenting the world. And I think yours is a really good case of transporting it from a small screen to a big screen and being able to to translate the bigness oh, of definitely. that. Oh, definitely. Yeah. What about you? Hmm. Well, I'm going to flip the script. Got a TV show shot. Ooh. Yeah. Um, it's not the, like, this shot's not going to win any awards or anything, but it's from an episode of Community um, to stay away from the weird stories of Dan Harmon and his mind. I love Dan Harmon. Basically, like, the bad guys are trying to convince um, all the main characters that the community college they'd been at for three years was actually uh, an insane asylum. Oh, I remember that episode. That's really um, good. But after they figured out that he was just pulling their chain, like he tries to cover his tracks and say, "Oh no, it was purgatory." And uh, in the if you don't earlier, watch community, you're confused. Yeah. Really. I know, I know. <laughs> that's with, that was with John Hodgman, right? Yeah. yeah um, John but in the way, like they used um, Dolly Zooms um, to kind of take you on that. Oh, they're really confused, and those kind of shots are very unnatural. Um, And so you kind of, that takes you into the emotion of what they're feeling. Um, But one shot after um, the, that guy that Blake said. John Hodgman? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) After he told them they were in purgatory, like no one believed them except for one guy. And he was like, oh, I knew it. And it had the dolly zoom. Um, But out of the ridiculous of that, like he got slapped and it was like, stop making, letting him make you realize things. Um, But it never cut from the shot. Like it did the Zolly zoom, making you feel very unnatural, but then it slapped you. The shot straightened up and it kind of got shaky and followed the guy who uh, got slapped instead of like cutting away to the guy who was saying it. Uh, And the reason I thought of that shot is because that whole thing was all one shot, one person did it kind of way it took you on the path of that whole train of thought in that one shot. Um, and I think especially with what you're wanting us to do with talking about these things is how this can make your storytelling better and how important it is that even like you don't have to cut to someone saying the dialogue, you can tell what you're wanting to all in one shot, even if you're not showing the person who's talking. Yeah. I think that's a good example too of using a camera um to enhance the way you're trying mm-hmm. to tell a story like i mean i'll look at the shot you'll be able to see the shot what are you talking about that's what i said <laughs> no i'm I, you <laughs> said it was a good thing i was like yeah it's a good thing to use the camera to enhance your story like anyway sorry <laughs> what is but i'm saying like using, a, a very, using like a, using a camera technique to give disorientedness and even i guess make a joke i have to yeah. watch, when i watch it when i put it together on the everything podcast. in community is a joke yeah. <laughs> yeah not not like it's the show's a joke but like but the show's a joke the, but it's, it's all been turned, one the show has joke. been turned into a joke yeah, I, just, I missed the gas leak season i haven't yeah. watched since the gas leak season. <laughs> there's a few good episodes <laughs> um the purpose of a good they say a good edit is one that you don't notice yeah mm-hmm. 
Is that not the same for a shot? I don't mm. know if I would say that. I don't know if I agree with that. I was just throwing the question out there. Yeah. To be thought provoking, but it might not have worked. I think there's also a difference when well, they, you look at like a group of, of production people and what they notice compared to just the average person and what they notice. So the average person yeah. I don't think would notice, you know, each of these shots as being good shots. They may feel it and and it might impact them into liking whatever's happening more, but they might not be able to notice, hey, this shot is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we're here for, to help you I explore the emotions. Editing, though, don't you? You'd notice what? I mean, I notice great editing. Yeah, I'll notice a but great if you shot. notice a great edit, does that not make it a great edit? Because a great wouldn't a great edit be? No, I would yeah. say that, it, like especially f- like Blake was saying, from production people, like I notice editing pretty regularly, like mm-hmm. in movies, and so, um, like I talked about on the first one, in Scott Pilgrim, all the transitions are just really cool edits, mm-hmm. and so. Um, the YouTube channel that people should subscribe to, besides Fly Dog Productions, Every Frame of Painting. I think we've talked about it. Yeah. But have you watched the one about Edgar Wright? No. He talks. He talks about how Edgar Wright uses shots and transitions and cuts for comedic purposes, mm-hmm. whereas most comedies don't. Most comedies are just filmed around really funny people doing improv. Mm-hmm. And the camera's not really part of the equation, and that it should be. I think the thing that made me laugh most about yours is that you didn't pick out a shot. You just said the whole beginning. Mm-hmm. So, that's well, it. and I, I think we picked establishing shots because they're establishing and they're the most remember, memorable. memorable. Yeah. So yeah. mine's probably an establishing shot. It's not the beginning of the movie. You know, but, people can't see air quotes, right? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> air, quote, 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 air quote, air quote, quote, quote in air quote. It establishes the scene. It's the first shot of a scene. Of a character, too. Oh, and of a character. It's establishing the world yeah. that this character lives in, but it's in Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, I've been looking at a lot of Steven Spielberg stuff lately and trying to analyze the way he shoots, and he has a really clever way of doing one shots. Everyone likes a one but Steven Spielberg's are usually a lot more subtle. And there's a scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where they introduce um, Marion, um, and they're in the uh, bar, her bar, and she's doing a, a shot contest with an Eskimo. I guess is it Eskimo? It would be that'd be Serbian. Alaska. It was like Tibet, a Serbian. Tib- 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 Tibetan. A middle Tibetan. He's Asian. <laughs> she. And he's, everyone's no, an Eskimo. No, the dude's the Asian. She is it's a girl. A, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's a dude. An Eskimo. Uh, what does that mean? I'm per- I, I could be know. wrong, but I'm pretty sure it's a Ask Christopher I think it's a really lady. fat dude. I think it's a husky lady. Okay, well, <laughs> the people who watch the podcast will know the answer because it'll be in there. Like, comment, and subscribe if you know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but it's this really cool shot that establishes the world. It's got some comedic elements, but he goes from a wide shot to a close-up to an insert all in the same shot. So they're following... As the people take the shot, put the shot back down, they go to the next person, and it's all one shot. Um, but it's just a really clever way to make movies cheaply uh, because they only had to do one lighting setup for that whole scene. They only had to do one camera. I mean, you had to nail it, but they only had to do one camera move. And I feel like um, for low and no budget filmmakers, being able to interestingly tell your stories without a lot of setup saves you time um, and it saves you money. And it's a real interesting way to keep. To keep the flow in the movie, and you don't mm-hmm. have to do any edits. So I really like that shot. Um, in an interview with Steven Spielberg, um, his previous movies had gone way over time and way over budget. And Raiders was the first film that he did with, I guess the only one he did with Lucas. And they were really good friends. And he made it a point not to do that, not to go over budget, because was, Lucas was producing it, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. He didn't want to go over budget and over time. With Lucas, so Raiders was shot very efficiently. Yeah, and he does that a lot in his movies. If you look like um, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, there's a lot of oneer shots. Jaws, there's a lot of oneers that are just small and shifty. Every frame of painting, you can look at the oneers of, of, of Steven Spielberg. But the cool thing that he does is he just, is in his blocking, and so a lot of it's in the rehearsal and how you move actors to where you keep the shot interesting, even though it's a locked off shot. Yeah. <laughs> You back in? You good? Yeah. I just enjoyed a good donut while listening to that conversation. 
So, Toy Story 4. Oh, yes. Very oh, excited about that. Segue, Austin. Yeah. Thanks. I love it. There's no cameras involved in that, right? No. They're uh, cameras. 3D cameras. <laughs> They're cameras. <laughs> They're quote cameras. <laughs> so, the question I would have is, as great of an ending for Woody and the gang that was in Toy Story 3, is Toy Story 4 a good idea? Is Woody going to be in it? Probably. I would- I don't know how you can have yeah. Toy Story 4 I don't without think we, William Buzz. We don't know anything about the story, right? No, no we just Correct. know that John Lasseter is directing, and he took a picture, and they just started. Right, okay. I think I'm assuming they have a script. Yeah. I'm assuming. I think it's... I think it's <laughs> just start animating. We'll come up with something later. Hey, they can do it. I think it's a yes and a no. Uh, yes, because like even after the third one, they put out a lot of... Excuse me, mini cartoons. Right. And I'm sure if those did really well... And even building a new audience for a tour story that may not grown up with the movies, like Dune the Fourth One may be really good. They'll still get some of those young kids now that are seeing those mini art tunes and are familiar with the story. Uh, but also know from the viewpoint of actually growing up with the movies and like you said, like the third one was just a great ending to it. I think that's a great place for it to end. Yeah. And doing a fourth one really doesn't have any bigger like i don't think it's i'm trying to my mind is not i think you hit on well. something where i think the shorts that they've been putting out are they speak to a different audience than like the original lovers of mm-hmm. toy story um now i mean i remember watching toy story a long time ago i don't remember how old i was but Probably like twenty five or <laughs> no thirty. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm twenty six now. Uh, so I was I don't know. I'm a few years older than was it nineteen ninety. Andy. Andy Andy was born ninety ninety one ish somewhere. Yeah, so I'm just a few years older than Andy, and and the movies you know have aged up uh, in in time like, and with real time. So if that helps put you there, but I think. Um, the difference, like you can't just say, "Oh, these shorts are successful, therefore a movie will be successful." But I think it is evidence for sure. Like they are successful, which proves to us that whatever cast they have now works. Mm-hmm. Um, they have they've added in new toys, new characters, and they've lost some, but it still works. Um, I I do think it'll have a different feeling because <clears throat> because of the nature of the third movie and how it definitely ended an era um we'll probably expect something a little different for toy yeah. story 4 but when it all comes down to is it a good idea is it a bad idea i think pixar is some of the best storytellers in the world yeah, that's what I was so say. if anyone Lass- can do it they yeah. can i think john lasseter we were sent out a text message when we saw it, and me and Austin might disagree, but they haven't made a bad one. <laughs> and so I thought you hate Cars too. Yeah, no, he's saying they haven't made no, a bad Toy, Toy Story. Story. Oh, a bad. And Toy I would Story. say out of all their movies, to me, they've made one bad one. I think their that track you haven't record seen? that I haven't seen. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't like Cars so anyway. And you didn't like Brave much either. Um, I didn't think it was their best, but I don't think it's bad. Like I think it's relative. Like. I gave it a oh, B+. Oh, no, plus. relativity. <laughs> later, we'll spoilers, later, we'll later, later Tyler. But what I'm saying is, is if anybody <laughs> has a free pass to make a movie, is it John Lasseter? Like, yeah. Let's be honest. I'll, I'm going to be there. I'm going to watch it in theaters. and oh, yeah. Even if it got like terrible reviews, I'd still watch it. And it's probably not. Like The worst oh, thing yeah. it is, be like, I mean, Cars 2 still got like <laughs> 70 probably percent. On yeah, is, it being question, terrible. is yeah. planes a uh, Pixar? It is um, Pixar, yes. Yeah, but that one was released uh, by Disney. Yeah, I think they gave them rights to that, that rules. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think they gave them rights to that world. Was it oh. to save face where they're like, oh, oh we'll but I think no, it's probably Disney Studios. I, I imagine just the way that those movies work, um, and it, it's not just planes. Uh, I mean, planes fire and rescue. Yeah, <laughs> well, historically, uh, Disney's put out a lot of strange sequels that people unanimously agree aren't as good and it's not just like 
the concept yeah. of sequels aren't as good. I mean, they're clearly, it's weird. Yeah, Cinderella sequel, Mulan sequel, you know. They put out yeah. those direct yeah. DVD things for Pocahontas right. Pocahontas too. And I think, well, I, think what some, I think what some Peter people Man don't too. understand what? is, um, <laughs> although they are created by those studios, it's a lot of times like the B team or the C team <laughs> in the studio that it'd be us working. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, it's, uh, well, and they're letting them practice. And I mean, yeah. they know that the market's going to be like toy story two was supposed to be a B team effort. And it was good enough that they got a release planes Two was supposed to be direct to DVD. Um, and it was deemed good enough to get a release. Quote, quote, <laughs> quote, quote, good. Yeah. Um, I never saw planes. I haven't I'm seen it either. I'm definitely going to see Boats, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, out of the three Toy Story movies, Toy Story 2 is not my favorite. It's not bad by any stretch of the means. I did not enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I did not not enjoy it. I'm not going to say that I didn't not. As Jake really Ziegler, don't want Ziegler to would say. It. 50-50 is pretty bad. <laughs> well, I either liked it or I didn't. It's 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Toy Story 3. Two. Toy two. Story 3 is at 99. Two? Two. Toy Story 3 100%. was the lowest rating. That's surprising. Yeah. Toy Story 1 had 100. It is a 2 7.9 on IMDb. I'm telling mm -hmm. you, like, critically, Toy Story 2 is most people's favorite. Mm -hmm. That's weird. Wait, so Rotten Tomatoes, is it 100% from both well, like fa fans and what critics? What list are you looking at? You're just looking at Rotten Tomatoes score? Yes. Because I know on IMDb... It is 86% from user, 100% from critics. I know on IMDb, Toy Story 3 is high, is the highest Toy Story mm -hmm. movie in terms of critics. Yeah. And well, on critics, on I'm pretty list. sure Toy Story 3 on Not there is 99%. Level. It's the lowest on Rotten well, we'll Tomatoes. Well, but I'm, I'm just saying, like, a lot of people that... The, and the opening scene of Toy Story 2 is really cool, where it's the video game... Mm -hmm. It's the Buzz yeah. Lightyear. Toy Story oh, yeah, 3 yeah. is 99%. Yeah. That Dang. one's really cool. Yeah. But the opening scene of Toy Story 3 is really cool, too. Yeah. Oh, it's that 89 was amazing. From it's, it's more of a opening, child's imagination. I oh, I loved it. Yeah, because yeah. it well, was... 11% um, of those people don't have a heart. It was all of them, you know, playing uh, like how they did with Andy. Uh, but what was really cool about it is they kept saying all these lines that came from the toys mm -hmm. yeah. in their imagination world, but it's all the lines that we heard Andy say while he was playing with the toys yeah. in the nice. first movie. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of like that memory of playing with Andy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I loved it. It was really cool. Yeah. If you're curious, Toy Story has the highest user score at 92%, and it's got 100% from critics. So there's that one critic that saw Toy Story 3. I uh, saw, saw one, said, I love it. Toy, two, love it. Three, yeah. not as much. And I don't agree with that. But uh, by a yeah, that guy, he should just that one squirt. guy. Yeah. I, that's what that means, right? There's a hundred people who yeah. credit. <laughs> and that, this. But we're missing the biggest news of to the Toy Story four announcement that Rashida Jones is writing on it. So she's writing it. She's on the writing team of oh. Toy Story four. I like Rashida Jones. She's funny. Yeah. That's I think a it'll weird be fun. She's addition. so funny. Yeah, I love her. So uh, other big news that came out this week: Star Wars. Seven, not seven. No, seven. Seven. Well, seven. 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 Technically seven. Star Wars Seven has a title. What is it? The Force, Force Awakens. Awakens. Some people absolutely hate it. Some people are like, I like it. So I was when did say more when excited did the Force fall asleep? I don't remember that. <laughs> maybe when um, maybe when Darth Vader died, it fell asleep for a while, and now Luke Skywalker, or I guess it's Han and Leia's kids. Anyway, Luke can have a kid. In does, the comics, Leia is also a Jedi. Yeah. Doesn't she learn how to use the Force? So does yeah, Han but Solo. she's so bad at it, she just quits. <laughs> <laughs> like, she stops at some point. The Force is like, uh-oh, Leia wants a part. <laughs> I can't tell because I'm not a comic book guy. Are y'all joking? Or? No, for real. No, well, yeah. there, there's books and comics that Though, expand on the universe. To even, be super those nerdy. Don't exist those in aren't, this universe. Aren't those can those aren't those aren't not even no. canon anymore. No. They used to be. Yeah. Um until Disney. Until Disney goes, No, we're no. just gonna stick with the movies that we have the rights to. Yeah. I <laughs> So does this does the title make you more excited, less excited, or the same? You're at the same yeah, excitedness? it's the same. Like I saw someone it's a very say boring title. Yeah. Well, they, they said like I it falls in line with the, the other titles back. because the other oh. titles are very generic. Yeah, that sounds name Yeah, the like it goes in line with that, but... Except A Phantom Menace. Yeah, but The Force Awakens, I mean, it, was the Sith Lord, it man. fits in with the movies coming back. 
Like, yeah. yay. But I think you could have found a different word than Awakens. Awaken. Like, return of the, the Force. The Jedi. Because, <laughs> <The Jedi. laughs> again, Empire strikes back. The Force strikes back. Rise of the Force. Return of the Empire but maybe it was, striking Maybe back. the Force has been dormant for a while Force because the dormant. world has been at peace. Jedi. I mean, no, there was. Are you are you saying the gap between? Jedi. Yeah, back between six and seven. Like, what what Luke are they and saying? Leia is the, the well, day and, what are they saying? Well, is they, the time frame between six and seven. Uh, I think they have years, adult kids. Uh, it's thirty years. I yeah, because they're they're the same age they are now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So, it, however much time has passed from episode six to now, so that's how long it's about been. thirty years. Yeah. Probably what it's going to do is going to play off the fact that. The force was balanced after the chosen one destroyed the emperor. Is the chosen one Luke? No. Oh. I think. No. I think the. Is the chosen one Leia? No. I think it was Vader. The chosen ones. Remember all those metachlorians? They were all. Yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, well, I mean, I think I'm pretty sure that. I'm sorry. I think that's like what six basically revealed. It's like, oh, uh, Anakin was the chosen one all along. He just that's went down why, the horrible path, but then he brought balance to the force by killing the emperor. That's why Obi Wan yelled, "No, you were the chosen yeah. one." Yeah. Right, Do you I, remember that? This is as confusing as you remember Matt Taylor's tweet rampage. The other day. <laughs> oh, did you follow that at all? Did you try to? My phone blew up. Y'all tagged me. And I, <laughs> I was hoping you would say something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me jump back in. Okay, so the question I have though, J.J. Abrams is notoriously like tight-lipped. Mm-hmm. And very secretive about his projects, but it seems for some reason with this Star Wars thing, he has not been at all. Like he's constantly tweeting pictures of Millennium Falcons and showing us the full cast, and we know a lot of the story. Why do you think? Is it's it because misleading? Star Wars people are so crazy, or is he like really going to twist it on us? I, I think. think he's trying to. I think it might be because super fans are crazy. <laughs> or is that just the world we live in now with I think maybe Marvel um, and he's just trying to make make people feel at ease yeah about a seventh movie yeah because I agree with that because if pe- if George Lucas would have taken pictures on the set of Phantom episode Menace. Of Phantom Menace <laughs> people would have been like uh, probably not gonna see that movie I don't know. People were excited about Phantom Menace. Yeah. And then they saw it. And more. then they saw it. Because they had no pictures or Twitter or like. I will be uh, honest. I'll be honest. I, I liked Phantom Menace the first time I saw it. But we I think seven? I was 11. Wait, 7? We were older. Out? It was 2000. Like 90, no, it was like... I thought it was 2000. Nine, I think it was 1999. Yeah, I was a, a child. So and I, I just little, liked I the uh, the lightsaber battles. and the, Yeah. Dude, double-bladed lightsaber? That was, the, that was amazing. I know, right? And pod racing. Do you remember how many people were Darth Maul for Halloween after that movie? Five. Like there was a ton of Darth Maul, and then because everybody got the eye contacts, their eyes went bad. <laughs> because if you wear those like red contacts or whatever it was, I think it was like red and orange. If you wear that too long, it will damage your eyes. Awesome. The more you know, um, don't dress yeah. up like Darth Maul. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think it's more of not trying to oversaturate it. It's more of, hey, this is like it's been a while since a movie. And now we're going afterwards instead of going backwards. Yeah. And since they're involving the original cast and stuff, I think it's, and I don't think it's been too much that he's really released. Like a lot of the pictures have been weird. But you don't think it would have been cool to not know if the Millennium Falcon was going to be in the movie and see it later. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah. I guess I never really thought about it not being in the movie. Yeah. That's what that I'm sounds, at. Like you, that I'm just saying. Weird. Like you remember a time when we like were genuinely surprised by what we saw on screen. Mm-hmm. Like we're about to transition to Interstellar here in a second. I mean, I was and there surprised. were some genuine surprises. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, we didn't know that that actor was going to be in there, type thing. Yeah, so, but I think that stuff is way too expected to where people see it as ruining a surprise. Because I don't think people see it as a surprise if the Falcons yeah. in there. I mean, it's. Like tweeting, tweeting stuff out and stuff like that. I think now is a form of marketing. Like there are people who are going to get more excited like when people about people leak their own sex tape. Sure, I'm, I'm going to take that out. But I've done that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, so repeat that. Sentence. So I think I think it just seems like it's it's just a form of marketing. You know, people are like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to see it. And they're like, oh, the Millennium Falcon's in it. 
you know, maybe I should go watch it. I don't know why you would yeah. see it for a ship. Yeah, I feel like with Star Wars, it's a, it's a special circumstance. Like the fan base is so large, and, and they've been around for so long. And you know, Star Wars has been doing stuff steadily over the mm-hmm. years. Uh, I feel like the fan base kind of feels like it's theirs. Like I mean, it, it's not. It doesn't belong to JJ, and mm-hmm. so it's almost like he's been given an opportunity to like be an ambassador. For yeah, Star be Wars. an ambassador for Star Wars, and so it's mm-hmm. almost like we expect him to tell us what's going on because it's ours, not his. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like the feel that I get for it compared to other movies. I don't know about you guys. I mean, I think you have a point there. Like Star Wars has been putting stuff out constantly. Like there's been some form of Star Wars universe story being put out constantly for the last, like at least since as long as I can remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, But like, I mean like Phantom Menace came out whenever I was eight. I looked it up. It was 99. And then the last one, uh, episode three came out in 2005 and since 2005 they've had like tv shows and cartoons and like ewok christmas specials constantly. a lot of video games a lot yeah. of video games dude i played yeah. battlefront 2 all the time yeah. what's the new star wars show that's out right now the star wars what there's a star wars animated oh, show. Rebels. Uh, yeah. star wars rebels it's supposed to be between episode three, three and, and episode four yeah um i mean like i think someone else said it like i think maybe a lot of it is just proving that He's got a good handle on that the movie. We're not going to get another Phantom Menace. Yeah. Well, because he also did Star Trek. And so I'm sure <laughs> that's a lot of taboo for people anyway. Well, because I'm sure even Hunter can say there's a huge view between Trek yeah. and Wars. I'm even a, Hunter. I'm and, a Trekkie. Yeah. You're a Trekkie? I'm a Trekkie. And I love the new Star Treks, even though I'm probably more of a Star Wars fan. Like, Seeing JJ on the set probably puts people at ease. He's like, okay, he's he's got it. He knows what he's doing. There's some cool stuff happening. So here's a question. I know with Star Trek, like I haven't seen any of the original stuff. All I've seen is JJ's new movies. Yeah, me too. That, that's the only Star Trek I've, I've ever seen. And he, God, I heart. feel like he did an excellent job of catering to that. Like I felt like I wasn't missing much. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, it inspires interest, and I may go back and watch some because of it. You need to go watch Rathacon. But, uh, like, those new movies, like, the characters were introduced to me well. I got backstory. I got context. And I understood what was happening. But you didn't have William Shatner. I would say, too, like, the Trek, the Trekkies, I mean, I think they're as rabid as some Star Wars fans, but they're definitely outnumbered. Mm-hmm. Like I think mm-hmm. there's way more Star Wars fans. I think Star Wars is just so ubiquitous now. Yeah. Well, my question was going to be, uh, do you think he's going to be able to do that with Star Wars Episode Seven? I think he has to. To an what, extent. cater well, to people who don't know the yeah. Star Wars universe. Yeah. Well, what was said, like this movie's, I think they're treating it like a send off for the original cast, in a way. Um, so to where it, like the new cast is still going to be play a, a very important part. It's just not the original. It's a transition. Cast. Yeah. From, well, I think they said yeah. that at first, but now I think because they, I think I've read stuff that since Harrison Ford's on set, like he's taking a bigger role. Wait, well, it could, started. Yeah. It started out not like that, but yeah. then recently, like they yeah. said, he, oh, we're treating it more like a send off to the original, yeah. and they're gonna because he, he said, JJ, we're gonna put me more in the movies. And gonna, is that how Harrison Ford talks? Yeah, you never watched him in the interviews. <laughs> That's how he talks. His interviews are crazy. Yeah, they're like, and then we uh, we got on set in London, and we just. <laughs> I watched Blade Runner once. Is that the same thing? We were yeah, forced to watch Wars. Blade Runner it's once. Star Wars Blade Runner. Be good so person. speaking of crazy, last night we watched a three-hour movie that started at ten thirty. That was crazy. Yeah. I got home at two in the morning. That was kind of crazy. Uh, so we're gonna talk about Interstellar, Christopher Nolan's new movie. Um, we will be spoilerific, I'm sure. I think it'll be too hard not to be. So if you want to quit listening, uh, you can fast forward. We'll put the timer that we stopped talking about Interstellar in the comments. I guess, can you do that in the podcast on no, iTunes? No, no, I think no. you can put it in a, yeah, you can put it in the description. Just edit in like a Just, yeah. uh, yeah. yeah, do that. Just put it in a okay. spot set. Follow us. 45. On, if you don't want to skip yeah. ahead, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> like, comment, subscribe if you Instagram, like spoilers. Yeah. Or if you don't, okay, bye. too. <laughs> So, Interstellar, um, was it what you were expecting? It was a story about space travel. Yes. So, <laughs> a little bit. No. Okay. Why? What were you expecting? I expected three-fourths of it. Okay. <laughs> um, Moving on. So, you just didn't expect the bookcase? 
Like all that <laughs> stuff. Like I knew that was gonna happen. It made me so mad. Like it felt like the exploration stopped. And like I'm not saying like taking that twist was not right or wrong. But when you're going to that movie, you think it's going to be, oh, they're going to find a place. That's how it's going to end. Everything's Did you think they be. were going to find aliens? Yes. I didn't. Not, you didn't? At the it, first it was, mention of, of time relativity, I thought, it's going to be humans. Are they? Now, I didn't yeah. know if it was going to be him. I, I, I didn't quite convince myself of that. But yeah, as soon as they started talking about how time flows differently, it's like, okay, they're going to end up creating a civilization and, and that's what who they are. They're gonna help themselves. They're gonna fix themselves in some sort of time loop. Yeah. Time. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go around. What are things we liked about the movie? It was pretty. It was very pretty. You took my answer. <laughs> yeah, I, there's things in that movie that I've never even thought to have seen. Right. Um you talk you right. talk so, about the wormhole. So I mentioned this uh we all saw this movie together and right after the movie we talked for a little bit about it. And so, for a little bit, it was like 30 minutes. Right. So <laughs> one thing I mentioned was I don't think I'd ever felt so much anticipation for what something was going to look like. So whenever they start traveling towards this wormhole, like it's about to happen, they're heading towards it, and like the visuals start changing, but you don't know exactly how it's going to resolve, and then it happens, and it looks amazing. And that happens several times in the movie. Would you have been mad if it was like a, just a hard cut? Yeah. Or if it was like the Star Trek warp time yeah. through the Boop. stars. Just, leaves leaves uh, yeah. fire trails behind it. Yeah. <laughs> I think the thing I love, DeLorean. <laughs> I love about Christopher Nolan, I know some people don't like everything about him, but he is wholly original, I would say, like for lack of a better like. I don't know what goes on in that guy's head. I don't know what he dreams about. I don't know what he writes down and talks about with his wife. There is a lot of stuff in that guy's head, and he really likes flipping worlds upside down. I mean, yeah, he yeah. came he up with like Batman, it. right? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I was going to say that his original pieces that he are solely his IPs, I guess that's how you'd say that. It's intellectual property. Well, the stuff that he created, yeah, I would so say, like yes, Inception. all that is very, yeah. But, I mean, The Dark Knight's not that. Well, I mean, it's been written <laughs> yeah. for six yeah. years. So. But. I would agree with that. But like he, that d- he likes to show you things that you never. I mean, the wormhole was cool. The black hole was cool. The ice planet was cool. Oh the, yeah, the ice planet. The frozen clouds. The was frozen a weird. cloud yeah. thing was like, and Austin complained about this. The obvious exposition where he, like they're flying into this frozen planet and they hit a cloud and then Matthew McConaughey goes, "Frozen cloud." <laughs> like, oh really? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. <laughs> the but I even liked like on the okay on the water planet like those waves were not. They're just, just, I mean, there was like science, like they're right next to a freaking black hole. Like, they're, of course, the gravitational pull would make waves be weird. Oh, I didn't think about that. He tackles very, he tackles issues that have not yet, like, really been figured out yet. Mm-hmm. So it grants him a lot of liberties to be creative with it. And I think I really enjoy that about his movies. That shot where they're passing Saturn and you just see the little dot, like, mm-hmm. that was so stinking cool. And I know yeah. that. Blake, you probably could make a shot similar because I mean we all have images. You, you know what I'm saying? Too much. But you know what I'm saying? Like it's just Saturn and a little dot of light. Oh, like yeah. it's just <laughs> just Saturn. It's just get that, but, just get the second I mean, like, largest planet. In I mean, I could system. just go outside and take a picture of Saturn, and we're good. <laughs> but I just think like just some keyframing, like <laughs> things that you like. They're not. I mean, there were some very complex graphics and right. visual effects but at the same time like space and just showing the bigness and the littleness of, of humanity and um when the uh when the one doctor i don't even remember his name miller i don't want to say the Beardy? black guy but oh uh, <laughs> his name's like ronald or something no, I um remember. but like just him talking like he gets a little bit of space cabin fever and he's freaking out that, that all that, that stands between them and millions of miles of nothingness is a few inches of aluminum. Like, right. I yeah. mean, you really feel that. I like uh, Matthew McConaughey's uh, response. Response, because it sounds like so made up. Like, yeah. What he says, the, they, some of the yacht, best yachtsmen in the yachtsmen world. don't know how to swim. It's like, 
Really, where'd you read that? <laughs> but <laughs> if I did that, learn, <laughs> where's that in the footnotes? If I did learn anything, like it's opinion. if you go out on a space exploration, bring nature sounds. Yeah. Or he, he gave him the little headphones yeah. with it, and I was like, that's really smart. Like, yeah. I would never have thought of that. Or make sure there's life jackets on a yacht. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Okay, other things I, or things I really liked about it. Yes, it was very, very pretty. And I would say, like, using the word awesome in the most literal sense. Like, there were so many times where I looked at the screen and was completely in awe. There's a guy behind us that was in awe, too. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, lots of expletives. It was very a pothead, like, (laughs) mind-blowing. I made made the... Like watching the Blu-ray version of Earth. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or um, any other stoner thing. Cosmos. But I think the other things I like is he is whether whether you like the sentimentality of it or not. I like telling big stories that are focused centrally on human emotions, and so at the heart of the story, yes, there's this big big space thing and big stuff that we don't know, but it, but it's really also the story of a, a dad wanting to get back home to his kids, and so I mean I appreciate things like that. Like I was really invested in that part of the story. I cried. Did you really? Yeah, it was oh. sad. It was a little teary. Yeah. Like whenever I didn't, whenever <laughs> she, he first saw her at like thirty three. Yeah, like I was just like, dang, mm-hmm. that that would suck so and you, bad because that, for him it was like hours or like maybe a couple days. Yeah, but like for her it was you know twenty three years. years and she's super mad at him still. Mm-hmm. And I liked even that that aspect of. Did my dad leave me here on this planet to die? Like, I mean, I just thought that that was really. I mean, I think the part where I, I cried the most is at the in the end when she's, when she's 70, 80, whatever she is. And he's 123. Yeah. But I think Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> like a lot of people were interested in that casting choice, but that dude can play mm-hmm. Heartbroken. He's the ultimate like space mug. cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, and Heartbroken, tough. like. The, the there's a there's a shot a close up of him in the car when he drives away, mm-hmm. you know when he's going to space. Oh yeah, yeah. and then yeah. when they're counting down the rocket, like yeah. I love that sequence that because you don't cool. see. Was so yeah. cool. And he he looks in the under the blanket to see if she's there. Again. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was that was pretty touching. It was. It, that was one of the few movies I don't get motion sickness, but <laughs> <laughs> when they're in I the um, when they first what's the big docking. <laughs> Sorry, what's the big uh, docking station that? They, oh, the, the endurance. endurance. The endurance. That's right. The endurance station when it's spinning to try to calibrate for mm-hmm. artificial oh, yeah. gravity. I couldn't watch that because the Earth was in the window and it was doing spinning. something. It was spinning. Yeah, was like, it's oh, kind of interesting. I, I think they wanted you to feel sick. Yeah. Yeah. I and I like I don't get motion sickness, but I had to. I was feeling uneasy. I think it was a mixture of visuals and sound. Like I don't remember being that, and maybe it's space in general, but that like. Invested in the the outcome, yeah, and what's happening actually on screen. Like, um, I'll explain the scene in a minute, but probably since gravity, like, has made me like like my chest thumping, and like the scene where <laughs> where uh, Doofus, we can talk about him in a minute, blows up the endurance. Oh yeah, and then like you, they have like thirty seconds to figure out what they're gonna do before yeah. this whole spaceship blows before away. Before they die like, in that, space alone. That 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 scene itself is like. Like the mixture of sound, the visuals. I love how they played with the silence of space. Mm-hmm. I don't but think I love music it so much. Much. I didn't breathe the entire time. And did you notice, Joey? Like there were some parts where, and the, and they did it on purpose. But the score. Did, did we say Zimmer did the score? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, but where the Man's score is so like intense, like almost to a point where you can't it's hear unbearable. some dialogue. Mm-hmm. But it was in, like unbearable to the point where you just like your chest is pumping, 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 yeah. pumping, yeah. pumping. And you can't help it. And like parts of those movies, like when a movie can make you feel, and yeah, we'll talk about what we don't like about it in a minute. But man, like That's what parts I was of say. that movie are so perfect. Yeah. The, mm-hmm. um, even with a spinning space station, one thing that I noticed, and I don't know if you guys noticed this, but they had that super low rumble that they have in like the to make you feel like you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. But like it rotated around the room. So not only was uh-huh. the screen spinning. But like you, it sounded like it, the world was spinning. I like the squeaky um, tin, like it sounded like a tin roof flying up and down. That was like right behind you, yeah. like every time it shaked. Yeah, so yeah you could it, like feel it like was like things. hard to tell if that was a sound effect or if, or if there was some, or if the, the theater was, was collapsing. The, the theater to the yeah. ground. 
Okay, so Austin, I know you have some beef with Nolan and how he writes, so we'll let you do that, and then we can talk about other things about the physics, movie. physics, <laughs> um, and fourth and fifth dimensions. With, uh, I don't know what caused it, but starting with, I think, I guess it was Inception. Inception came out before Dark Knight Rises, right? Correct. Something about Inception, Dark Knight Rises, and this movie, Nolan. The way he writes his setups are very heavy handed, I feel like. Maybe it's because um thinking about it too much or something. The general public is not very smart. I don't and I don't want to say that because that makes me sound very pretentious. But well, I think that was it. Sorry. Uh I don't know. Something about it, um is some plot points are very overdone. And very repeated, very blatantly. Uh, for example, in this movie, um, they keep using the word they a lot because they're trying to figure the, out who they figure are. Who figure, figure out who are. they are. Oh, who are they? Who, who are they? they? Is. And I feel like I would have gotten it just two times if they would have said it. But they said it like I felt a lot more than that. Um, I And... The plot point of the backstory that something went wrong in the world and it's not the same anymore, that there was an old way of doing things and this is the they had to adapt to this new, more troubled world. That gets repeated, I feel like, too much to me. I get that it's a, like a dust bowl and something's wrong with the environment and the earth isn't the same. It's not the same earth that I know. And I felt like they were just... Heavy headed, heavy handed with that part, and that's the same way with Inception when they have to stop the movie. I felt like for like a good fifteen minutes and explain how dreams work with Ellen Page and how they have to say, "Oh, you need a what's the top thing?" Yeah, the totem. Yeah, you need a totem. 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 Don't forget your totem. <laughs> and <clears throat> the Dark Knight Rises. Wait, do I need a totem? Yeah, you need one. You, are you in a dream? You don't know that. So you need a totem. Um, Austin, here's your hat. Mm -hmm. I use my hat if it falls on the ground. Mm. Um, and there's some... Dark Knight Rises had some like that too. Um, but they were more along the lines of... He, Bruce Wayne, escapes from the jail pit. And like the next scene, he's already back in Gotham. The only parts that I thought were clunky expositionally are some of the sciencey stuff. Like where you have to over explain the science behind what they're doing. Yeah. But I partly I wonder if that's because like people got so upset about gravity, the movie, and if it Yeah. <laughs> gravity not the, the movie. Not, not, not gravity the like <laughs> you keeping me here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, if you feel like you have to over explain the science so people will be able to understand it. Mm -hmm. Because I I mean I wouldn't know. I'm not a theoretical physicist. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> but <laughs> let's hope not. Yeah. I forgot a line that and I made a joke about it to Blake when he they get a flat tire and <laughs> and he's teaching his son. You know, how, <laughs> here's how you change a tire because someday I might not be here. I'm like we, you're going into space. We get it. We saw the title <laughs> of the thing. You don't have to. Or he has to, he has to explain Murphy's law to his yeah. daughter, who's named Murphy. Yeah, I guess I haven't told you in your ten years of existence what you're named after, but here it is. Mrs. Law was a beautiful lady. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what did everybody else not like about the movie? It just got so freaking weird. It, it did get weird. I think for the most part, I, I liked the movie a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't think the science was too over-explained. I thought it felt pretty natural to me. I don't have a problem um, with that. I didn't have a problem with the science part. It's the, the not science part. <laughs> okay, so Joey, since we are spoiling... Okay, ahead. so like when he goes into that black hole, and there's like the weird bookcase time thing, I was... Like, it's not even that it was weird. It was, like, weird enough to, like, pull me out of the story that I was like, oh, okay, okay. Oh, so he's going to fix everything now because he somehow survived a black hole and now is in an alternate dimension. 
that's now in so, three dimensional space. So, in the story, space. the future humans are trying to help him communicate to people in the past. Yeah. Is it the future humans? Yes. That's what he explained it to be. And it could be... So, the future humans sent him through the black hole. Right. So See, I don't even remember hearing that explanation. The space well, time yeah. continuum. He, he said was it that, Michael Caine again? No, no, it was him when he was talking to the robot. He was talking to the robot while he was in the Tesseract, and he was saying... Not the Marvel Tesseract. The, no, it's yeah. all connected. The robot <laughs> we said... We just don't know it yet said something about they again and then Matthew McConaughey said well don't you get it it's it's us and then I thought made, by us and, he meant him and the and robot then, yeah, that's what and I thought then too. he said like not literally us it's it's like or, no the robot said we don't like how did we create like, yeah. we didn't create the test yeah. track and he said well not us humans like eventually will have the technology to be able to transcend these dimensions and create this test track and that was the question I had for you guys last night. Like it was a, and then me and Blake were talking about like the future human somehow survived long enough to send Matthew McConaughey back, right? To it's, say future it's the paradox humanity, where like, something can't be contingent upon itself. Yeah, and but it's it not is. it's not new to this movie. Like a lot of movies have had this issue. Um, Donnie Darko, where uh, what the engine off of a jet falls through time and like causes all of these events which actually end up causing the plane to crash in the first place mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So something causes itself and in that movie there's actually um a book that uh that one professor lady wrote and they never read from it verbally but i mean if you were like stop the movie and like you can actually read from the pages i know if you have the dvd you can actually access the information through that as well and the bonus features but it actually talks about this phenomenon and how it's unexplained and the only way it could possibly happen is if there's some um like a higher deity in charge of it all like to set it in motion um so god chose matthew mcconaughey to save the human race well that's how donnie darko explains it oh. um Matthew McConaughey explained it as future humans chose him to teach his daughter but, how to save the human race. Well, e- even so, like it's it's kind of like a perpetual motion machine. Like it, it's something that's set in motion, but it from it looks like it set itself in motion. Which that hence the paradox yeah. that it can't seem to have happened that way. I know in like. Uh, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. There's a lot of time travel in that. Uh, yes. And you go around and, and you solve puzzles and stuff. But w- one instance, uh, you uh, are an adult and you go to this village and you talk to this guy who's like really upset and he talks about how this little kid seven years ago came and played this song to control the weather and, and messed up his life. And, and then he teaches you the song. And then you, you can go back in time, go to him as a child, play the song, and mess up his life. And so <laughs> it's like, you know, who invented the song? Like, yeah. it, the, the guy only knew the song because you played it to him, but you only knew the song because he taught it to you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, it's definitely a paradox, but, I mean... I think the only thing that, if, if anything was weird to me... but. Like like I told you guys last night, like I think that there is no fifth dimension that we know of, and so Christopher Nolan can dream it up to be whatever he wants it to be. I mean, there there are um, legitimate studies into yeah. more dimensions. Uh, I know one book I was looking into explains up to ten dimensions and like what their purpose is. I mean, I think. I but think, we have an infinite number of universes, so yeah. those ten dimensions think, could be different. In I the think it was universe. just the well, stark. Actually, that was actually in in the the idea of these ten dimensions. The tenth one is what he called the omniverse, which includes all universes. Which is, I think, that's a Marvel thing, right? The multiverse is oh, the a multiverse. Marvel. Isn't, <laughs> isn't that just a big alien playing marbles with the galaxies? Right, that was yeah, Men in no, Black. The Men in Black. <laughs> Which I like hmm. in Men in Black how what is the first one when they're in, in marbles that mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. And then like in the second one they're in a a locker. Yeah. yeah. And uh, how you can't be both at all. <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of silly. Yeah. I think the stark the only thing that maybe pulled me out is this I mean it was a very stark visual to see miniature Matthew McConaughey in an infinite bookshelf Bookcase. that he can't get out of like i think that visual yeah i don't even know where you'd begin yeah yeah was a little i mean that was stark 
I don't know why if future humans can bring you back across space and time, they just can't let well, you go talk. <laughs> yeah, I think Let, that's part of it. Let's make more... Uh, like, if, if the future of the human race depends on a girl discovering Morse code, like... Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> on a watch. Yeah. Well, because her dad is like... Because her dad loves her. Fifth dimensionally <laughs> placed behind yeah. it. Yeah. The book yeah. I, I think she, that was the weird, the weird part, like, because I missed that whole explanation. Like, I heard him say, like, that's us. And like Joey said, I thought it was the robot and Matthew McConaughey. That was them. So, I like, I missed completely that the future humans put him in the black hole, all that stuff. But even if I would have known that, it still would have been weird to me. Because any other really story with time travel, setting stuff in motion, like, that stuff doesn't bother me. It was the fact that it wasn't, like, it was done in a different way. Like yeah. something that I can understand you was, going back in time and physically convenient. being there and changing something. Yeah, it seemed like it was almost yeah. too convenient for the, the way that it was set up. Yeah. But he, he did, at least they did have an explanation that I thought helped a little bit how he talks about they or the future mm-hmm. humans yeah. uh, who mastered the ability to send information through different dimensions, including time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, basically built the Tesseract for the limited third dimension Matthew McConaughey. And so the Tesseract was designed for him to understand pushing forces through time. And so yeah. it mm-hmm. it's, in my mind, like I'm thinking about this future civilization, they probably don't all interact with time the same way Matthew McConaughey did in this moment. This is probably like a rudimentary version of how that they... Uh, messed with the different dimensions and it was designed so that a third dimension being can understand it. That's why it, it probably looked too visually convenient. But I think it's a Because maybe it was convenient. Well, when he was, was falling into that be, yeah. the black hole and then it was just all of a sudden like all those rooms around him, I thought he was just going to hit the floor and die. <laughs> like like <laughs> it was some sort of like space station I think or he something. Was transporting through time. I mean, I, I got that. I didn't until Dude, that, he stopped. Dude, when the plane was breaking through, and like I mean, that was an intense scene mm-hmm. going through the black hole. Golly, yeah. I loved it. Yeah. The ejects into space into a black, black hole. hole. <laughs> Which, that was crazy. Um, according to physics, he would have disintegrated. Actually, he would have stretched. Well, they infinitely. said that physics don't. Physics doesn't traditional apply. Traditional first physics doesn't apply to a black hole because we don't know what's inside of a black hole. Yeah. Well, yeah, but the gravity of a black hole will stretch your feet before it stretches your head because it's that strong and it's that like quickly well, you're going have you first. ever been in a black hole Matthew McConaughey no <laughs> yeah, Matthew, no. McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey was in a on a sound stage in a green screen okay so your overall impression of the movie Tyler I mean I still in, enjoyed it I think if I go back and watch it like Especially when it gets to the bookshelf kind of scene, that part may come together a little bit more. Um, it just distracted me so much to where just the rest of the, in the movie, I was just like, okay, what's going on? Yep. Um, I need to make sense of this in my head for me to make sense of everything else. Um, but I will definitely want to go and see it in an IMAX again. Mm-hmm. Dude. Yes. Um, I don't know owning the movie just because it's, it's long. <laughs> and yeah, it's three hours long. Yeah, um, but overall, like low B, low B. See, I'd have given it like Way a higher for me. I would have <laughs> given it like an eight and a half or a nine out of ten. I thought you were saying A and before a half. <laughs> eight and a half. Mixed yeah, we're on course. two different grade scales. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if we can do this now. Eight and a half or nine out uh, of ten. Four point five stars before the bookcase thing. Like it would have been an it would have been an A before the bookcase thing, and that just. Drew, pulled me so far out of the story that it dropped it to like seven and a half or an eight. Yeah. Like a whole whole point value. I would give it a mini Reese's out of a random assortment of candy in a candy jar in a teacher's desk. Oh, that's so bad. For me, it's way higher. 1.9 thumbs up. Visually, <laughs> visually I say it was one of the best things oh, I've yeah. ever seen. So pretty. Um, four stars out of five. I think it would... <laughs> just keep mixing them. <laughs> I'll um, give it a... Uh, but that, was, that would be my honest... I think it was like so invested in it, and I have to give him props for... I mean, you guys said it's so different from what mm-hmm. we've seen. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. I think it was so funny. Like, I didn't expect it to oh, be really yeah. funny. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you thought it was what, really funny. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so like, I mean, it was engaging. Like I was not in, I mean, I was engaged for three hours. It did not feel like three hours. Mm-hmm. I did. I really didn't. Surprise of the entire movie for me, at least, was the funny robots. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, you see a giant in the trailer. It, they look like, I think we made a comment. They look like Minecraft people. Like, cause they just got big clunky legs and I thought they were just going to. Like I guess, like Austin too. I thought they were they were gonna turn out to be the bad guys. I'm so but. glad that was not the case. <laughs> and I enjoyed the science part. I enjoyed how different it took, how different it approached time, and um, I guess space, space, space time, time, <laughs> time and space and space time and gravity. <laughs> um, if only there was an space. And the science stuff time. didn't bog me down. The only thing I fault it for is really heavy head and heavy handedness at the beginning but i think that was just me being too critical well here's what we're the going la- to do because the last two movies that he did i saw the same thing i, I think just, i was looking for it also it. had a lot of stars in it that weren't matt damon yeah Casey oh yeah, Netflix, yeah. Oh. jessica chastain ellen bernston and I stars in the sky Topher, i thought i was like over grace i was like over grace he's got a thing for hunter, redheads hunter it was in space there were lots of stars out there uh, <laughs> But yeah, uh, even Anne Hathaway. I think you said something about you didn't like her performance very much, or her lines were clunky. But like, I thought I she did her really lines were well. clunky. I thought she did really well. Yeah. I thought mm-hmm. she did amazing. I feel like she just kind of got thrown into the end, into the end, like in the, the end, end. Just like yeah, no, it's like I was curious where she was. Well, not even that. And a lot of it goes back to How did Edmund still die? trying was to just get time. Like, did he die? Of old I age? Probably. Well, I think it was just still trying to get through the bookcase. And Who? then it's like, oh, your mom, oh, that guy's planet. She yeah, him. father daughter oh. reunited. Uh, go find, go find brands. That, that was whole weird. Big city. Yeah. Did he die of like old age? Because it took I think so long for probably. Him to get there. Wait, I think he set up shop, but like, there's no way to repopulate the. So there's he, no way to populate the planet with one Gordon? person. He probably died of old age because yeah. well, it was also had, like a lot of time. They didn't really go into in detail where their technology was in um, kind of harvesting all of those eggs that they had. So I don't yeah. know if she was. She may have been able to do it by herself. I don't know. Well, yeah, Inject but an but I'm uh, I'm talking about know. like the guy that that was on that planet. I think I think it's assumed that he just died. Yeah. I mean, they even said that before. She's all by herself. Like she even says, like he may be dead, but. Yeah. I'm gonna follow because, I mean, the gone, overarching theme of this was love. They're gone 23 years when they go to the water planet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, so they could have easily, through their travels, wasted more time on something. Well, and I 40 mean, years alone on a on a planet by yourself. He his daughter, <laughs> his daughter was 10 well, when he left. That and, was a rocket ship, and then she she was what like 70 or 80. Yeah, whenever yeah. he got back, so. Yeah. Or whenever they found him. Mm. And yeah. there's no telling how long it took Anne Hathaway's character to make it to that planet. Yeah. Blake, did you like it? I did. It was fun. I, I enjoyed it. I give it four apples. And I really <laughs> appreciate the originality. Certified fresh. And one orange. Yeah. One orange. No, we need to call it Certified Fly. <laughs> we rate that movie certified. as it's fly or certified. not fly. No, it's Certified. <laughs> I would Certified. say if it's a if it's a pass fail rubric, I would say pass. Yes. <laughs> Good to know. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for the spoilers of Interstellar. We're stopping to talk about that. Uh, we have gone over an hour. So, uh, recommendations for the week. Uh, everybody should play the game Resistance. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, card game. Can it's you, fun. Can you Google the rules to Resistance? Yes. Yeah. We'll, okay. we'll put a link in the description. If you like, <laughs> like, comment, subscribe. If you like resistance, Joey, your recommendation for the week. Why does it always come to me first? I already I said mine. You, you were it. second. Oh, recommendation for the week. Oh gosh. Ooh. Oh, uh, Taylor Swift's new album is awesome. I finally listened to oh, it. I haven't heard it yet. It's it's really good. You guys are coming over to the dark side. No, hey. everything yeah, I like everything up. before red. Everything before red, I hated. But like, I think it's because I hate pop country. Whenever she just went straight into pop or like red and then this album, I was like, I can do this. I like it. I, I can dig. I can dig. You just had to shake Yeah, if you like Shake It Off, you'll like this album. If you just had to shake Welcome off the other New albums. Welcome to New York. Welcome Ha-ha. to New York. I'm giving you a mean eye. Tyler, your recommendation for the week. Um, watched a three-minute 
three minute or four minute clip on how they made Birdman look like one shot in terms of camera shots and with color grading. And I love color grading and I want to. You love color grading? Yeah. Like I, I, I would love to be a colorist in the long gotcha. run. And that's something that's really, I felt like that I really want to become Oh, that uh, more, uh, more, more, more into it. Yeah. The coloring. Yeah. Like that stuff like is catch my, like my dad's an artist. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I kind of, I thought your dad was a pastor. He is, but he's huh. an artist. Like he, he, he paints, makes it art. Yeah. He paints the picture of Jesus with his words. Uh, no, but he actually, he actually paints. And, um, and so I kind of feel like I can see that kind of interest coming out in me, but with film, gotcha. um, but the video was really, really interesting. I, I liked it. I say, go watch it. I've always seen coloring as a necessary evil. What? I just, I don't know. Not like coloring like crayons and I'll draw on the menus at Joe's Crab Shack, but (laughs) no, like coloring video. I just like, I don't know. What's your recommendation, Blake? Uh, Blizzard Entertainment just announced (laughs) a new uh, IP. It's uh, supposed to be like Team Fortress 2, uh, but Blizzard, uh, I'm I'm not sure how familiar Hunter is with it or anyone else listening. Ooh, burn. I'm not. So oh, explain it. They, they're the uh, <laughs> studio that makes World of Warcraft oh. and Starcraft um, and Witchcraft and no, no. <laughs> and uh, they made they just announced this new game called Overwatch. I think is what it's called. Um, but yeah, it's supposed to be like Team Fortress Two. They have this uh, intro video uh, announcing it. It looks like looks like Pixar. They, it looks awesome. They make some of the best cutscenes ever. Their actual game never looked that good to me. Well, but, they're they're efficient. There's they yeah. know how to make something run well. Yeah, but their cutscenes are like top of the line, engaging and awesome. Ever since Warcraft came out, World of Warcraft came yeah. out. Yeah, so Overwatch is supposed to be a class based first person shooter with Pixar uh, graphics. I have heard it's going to be free to play, and there's going to be a lot of customization in it. So I'm looking forward to that, and so I'll be keeping an eye on it. Cool. I have one more recommendation. Okay. You should everyone should watch the Amazon Echo what Echo's really <laughs> thinking video because it's makes fun of the very bad Amazon commercial. If you first go watch Echo. If you haven't the, heard of Amazon Echo, the advertisement for the Echo thing. It's like a standalone series for your house and the yep. commercial's really funny. If funny. you want to talk about beating the script over you, go watch that commercial. That one's very bad. Well, my recommendation of the week is uh, Film Riot's Thursday episode. They reviewed the Sony A7 camera. It's an incredible low-light camera. They're getting... uh, (laughs) What? (laughs) (laughs) It's cool. If you're interested in stuff, they're shooting stuff with ISO of 40,000 and above. Mm -hmm. Like I think the camera goes up to something like 120,000 ISO. It's usable. So you can get like night vision. Yeah, if you if you watch the film ride episode, they go up to fifty thousand ISO and it's usable. Um, it sees better at night than your own eye does. Dang, it's I pretty, need new eyes. <laughs> it's pretty freaking crazy. Just the world is so close to replacing us with robots. Yeah, no, I mean, and and there's some definite disadvantages to the camera, but if you need an awesome low light camera mm-hmm. to shoot stuff at night, like that, it it blew my mind. So that's my recommendation for the week. Okay, well, that's it for this week and this week's episode of the Fly Dog Fly Talk podcast. I said the title right that time, guys. You did a very good job. I know, right? Yeah. So uh, next week, we'll look at our Doritos Crash the Super Bowl commercial. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about the process for that, um, that we went through for that, and Joey's bringing Tostino's pizza rolls. So, Mm. hey, Joey, Joey, you want to give us a social media shout out? Yeah, follow us on uh, Facebook, Fly Dog Productions. We have a website, flydogproductions.com. And on Twitter, we're FlyDogProd, because Productions was too long, I guess. And YouTube. Oh, and then we have a YouTube. Yeah, hopefully you're listening to us on YouTube or iTunes. Oh, and we're on iTunes, like actually on iTunes. We're so official. Tell all your friends and uh, rate us so we can get pushed to the, the What's Hot page. Yes, because we would be What's Hot. I'm always What's Hot. I'm going to talk with my mom. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> See you guys next week. Bye. Bye.